heart. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the prophet Ezekiel. For thus saith the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among the scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from the places to which they have been scattered on the days of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them in the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and in the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in the good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pastures on the mountain of Israel. I myself will be a good shepherd to my sheep. I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek out the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. 
Therefore, saith the Lord God to them, I will judge them between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged. I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set them one over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. <clears throat> I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious and inheritance among all saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. According to the working of his great power, God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills in all. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate one from another, people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. pray with me. Oh God, as we break open the bread of your word, may we who are full and complacent be given a hunger for justice, and may those who are hungry be given bread. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Consumed a lot of salt this uh, past week. <laughs> <clears throat> well, today is Christ the King Sunday, and it is the culmination of year A in the lectionary, the year of Matthew, the year of Emmanuel, God with us, the year of love your neighbor as yourself and love God, the year of the Beatitudes, the year of salt and light, the year of go out into the world and preach the gospel and baptize the nations. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. A fitting gospel and preaching partner for a year that has surely been easy to forget at times that God is with us. I won't go through the laundry list of everything we've experienced in the world in this past year, but, you know, I was commiserating with a former priest of Grace Church earlier this week, and we were saying, you know, even the elephants aren't safe anymore. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? You know, over this past year, we also experienced and endured perhaps the most divisive election year in modern memory, one that's left our country and our world in a state all too ready to label one another as goats and sheep. 
But I take heart in that uh, the times we live in are strikingly similar, believe it or not, to the international political climate that spawned the feast of Christ the King to begin with. Did you know that while many of the feasts of the church are hundreds, if not over a thousand years old, the feast of Christ the King did not start until 1925 when it was instituted by Pope Pius XI. Global tensions remained high after World War I. Fascism and nationalism were on the rise across the world. And the Feast of Christ the King was instituted by the Roman Catholic Church and later adopted by many Protestants to crown the church year with a reminder to Christians that our allegiance is first and foremost to our spiritual leader in heaven, as opposed to earthly supremacy, as was claimed by, at that time, the Italian prime minister turned a dictator, Benito Mussolini. And so, the feast we celebrate today is not one of patriarchy or empire or domination, but rather a day to fix our eyes on a king and a kingdom not of this world. As we turn our eyes and orient our hearts to our true king, Jesus the Christ, the same Emmanuel, God with us, who rules not from a distant castle in the sky, but as one among us, leading us and guiding us and teaching us as a shepherd companion, and we his sheep. The image of a shepherd king is prominent throughout scripture, most familiarly in the 23rd Psalm, but also in our passage this morning from Ezekiel, when God promises the exiles that he will seek the lost, bring back the strayed, bind up the injured, and strengthen the weak. All of this sounds lovely until we get to the part that Laura read with such gusto, the fat and the strong I will destroy. Not a promising word for those of us coming off of the Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> Maybe not strong, but certainly feeling uh, like a fat sheep this morning. And yet we see the way in which Christ, our shepherd, rules, because there's a certain gentleness even to his judgment. Because while God says that he will indeed destroy the fat and guilty and disobedient, how will he destroy them? It says that he will destroy them by feeding them. Quite the dust juxtaposition to destroy someone by feeding them. And what does he feed them with? Well, justice. Feeding them with justice. It seems odd, but in the words of one theologian, perhaps the disobedient sheep must be transformed in order to be saved. Perhaps a meal of justice will satisfy a hunger they never knew they had with a meal unlike any they'd ever experienced. Well, a similar such sheeply ignorance, sheeply innocence, is shared by both the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. Have you ever noticed that, interestingly, both the sheep who are granted entrance into the kingdom as well as the goats at the left hand who are denied entrance into the kingdom, neither knew when they had encountered the Lord in life. Both the sheep and the goats ask, when was it that we saw you, Lord? Apparently, neither the sheep nor the goats walked around in life aware of their status or aware of Jesus' presence. And so likewise, we can gather that neither group's good works were done out of motivation from a heavenly reward. And this is where, when taken in isolation, this text can become somewhat sticky because this text actually blurs a lot of uh, binary lines that uh, we tend to put up between ourselves and each other. For one thing, it blurs the line between uh, the dichotomy of faith and works. This is a problematic thing for a Protestant understanding of salvation um, because it says that uh, believing does not get us off the hook. 
that somehow our faith in Jesus and our works of service to him are bound together as we give ourselves in service to the least of these. It also blurs the lines between the persecuted and the privilege. It's undeniable that in its original setting, this teaching in Matthew is clearly set up in order to protect Christians. The early church community of believers were, in fact, in those times, the least of these, as they suffered persecution, sometimes death, by the Roman authorities. Of course, this kind of reading can get us in trouble in 2017 in America, uh, because more often than not, Christians are not the persecuted, but the privileged. But it shows the fluidity of how at times certain groups can be the powerful, and other times uh, we can find ourselves the least of these. It also blurs the religious lines between Jews and Gentiles and Christians, because notice that the passage here in Matthew opens up with saying that all the nations will be gathered before God. This is a judgment not just for Christians, but also and especially for Gentiles. And many think, scholars think that Matthew here is responding to the question, well, what about those who have never heard the gospel? Well, Jesus says, it doesn't matter if they've never heard the gospel because all people have access to me and in fact have encountered me in the world through the last, the least, and the lost. And so we know that many of these theologies play out in many different quarters of the church and society for better or worse. You can see how each of these readings can be, kind of have a shadow side. And in many ways, this is an absolute hallmark touchstone text on a paramount feast for followers of Jesus interested in ordering the whole of society in ways that promote the life, health, and dignity of all people, especially those on the margins most vulnerable to the powers of wealth and empire. On the feast of Christ the King, we in fact uh, indeed proclaim that Christ is King and Caesar is not, that Christ is King and Mussolini is not, that Christ is King and Trump is not. Well, that's pretty easy for us as Christians. It ought to be easy as Christians to make those claims. And the universal implications of this feast is indeed edifying for believers. And yet this feast and this text should also be unsettling for all of us because it is also deeply personal. And it calls into question all those categorical assumptions we make about ourselves and each other and our very identities. Indeed, deep down, I think we all know that each of us is a little bit sheep and a little bit goat. I know that for every act of charity I performed, I probably ignored 10 others. We also know deep down that each of us is at times the least of these. We all know what it's like to be on the outside, if not materially and physically, then spiritually. And as much as I am called to be good news and share good news with others, this text is a reminder that I need to receive it too. Deep down, we all know that we need one another, as slow of heart as we might be to admit it, which is, I think, at the core of what this passage is trying to teach us. Amidst all the binary categories that seek to claim us, rich and poor, progressive and conservative, faithful and agnostic, weeds and wheat, goat and sheep. Perhaps God is calling all of us, each of us this morning, into a sort of sheeply second ignorance or second innocence. If not an innocence, then at least an openness of posture, an openness of posture that holds lightly the identities and categories that can prevent us from meeting Christ in our neighbors and that frees us up for encounters of holy surprise. Jesus himself models a kind of fluidity of identity this morning in the text when he says that the one who sits on the throne of glory is the very one who lends his identity to the least of these. In the mystery of life and the cosmos, Christ himself demonstrates the spiritual interconnectedness of all creation together with the creator which to acknowledge is perhaps to inherit, to inherit the kingdom of God. 
several years ago, a woman named Danny Johnson encountered the kingdom of God when ABC approached her about appearing on a reality show called Secret Millionaire, in which very rich people pose as those of humble means to experience life on the other side while volunteering in the community incognito and identifying unsung heroes. Danny herself grew up in poverty and in fact was homeless for a couple years before building a multi-million dollar business out of the trunk of her car. A devout Christian, she and her husband were at first adamantly opposed to appearing on the show because they said, you know, we already live to give to begin with. We give away millions of dollars to the poor, widows, orphans, and sick on a regular basis. And they said, you know, we always do this in secret so that the recipients of our charity will be led to give thanks to the true giver of the gifts, God. But after praying about it, they decided to give the show a shot for the way in which it could inspire millions of others to live lives of generosity. So at the producer's direction, she moved into a tiny bug-infested apartment in the middle of the Western Heights neighborhood in Knoxville, where she was given only $40 a week to live on with no cell phone, no computer, no communication with her family. And she was quickly transported back to a, me a memory of a way of living that she knew all too well. As part of her mission, she was instructed to look for places to volunteer in the community without revealing her identity. And would you know that sadly, when she showed up at many community organizations, ready and eager with open hands to volunteer, she was turned away. When folks saw her humble, homely, unkempt appearance, they didn't think she looked like anyone with anything to offer. But eventually she found some takers. She found the joy of music school in the heart of inner city Knoxville, which uh, gives the gift of music lessons and free instruments to dozens upon dozens of kids in need every week. She also found the Love Kitchen, run by 82-year-old sisters Helen and Ellen, twin sisters, who in retirement took up their God-given assignment of providing meals for the elderly on a weekly basis. And she also found a warm welcome at Special Spaces, an organization committed to creating the dream bedroom for children with chronic terminal entrance, uh, illnesses. And while touring with the facilities and meeting with students and teachers at the Joy of Music School, Danny sh said she had to take a moment at one point to collect herself as she retreated into the break room where she broke down in tears. She was emotionally moved because she said she had been there herself. She said, I know the things these kids have smelled, tasted, seen, and heard. I know it personally. At the end of the show, you can imagine the surprise when she presented the Joy of Music School uh, with a $40,000 check, revealing her true identity and the uh, premise behind her volunteer efforts. But in the end, Danny insisted, you know, you don't have to start a Joy of Music School, you don't have to run a soup kitchen, you don't have to do any of those things to make a difference. The church and the world is so caught up with building $10 million facilities and putting our leaders in jets, flying them around the world. But instead, we're supposed to go to Matthew 25, to the least of these, she said. That's where we're supposed to go. If we're doing our job as the church, there would be no poverty. If we're doing our job as the church, the hurting would be helped. Danny concludes, let's just realize that we're all people and that we can use our lives to help somebody else. You know, that's how Christ comes to us. More often than not, incognito, in disguise. And I think in the end that Danny is right. Ultimately, we are all just people, a little sheep, 
maybe a little goat, but in the end, just people, no matter how rich or poor, no matter what we look like or who we know, we each have gifts to give, and we are each given infinite opportunities to serve Christ incognito through serving others each and every day. And none of us are off the hook as we assume the sort of sheeply innocence of kingdom citizenship, through, through which every encounter is an opportunity to encounter Christ himself and be transformed through our works of kindness, compassion, forgiveness, and grace. Again and again and again throughout this year of Matthew, Jesus has shown us that true life in God is ultimately gained by turning over our lives lived for self alone, turning over our need for control, turning over our tiny kingdoms so that Christ can truly be king and shepherd of our souls, of our church, and of our universe. When we do this, the selfishness that so often infects our hearts is fed and in fact destroyed by the food of justice. We may not be left with a million dollars or a crown, but we will inherit the only kingdom that will last. When was it that we saw you, Lord? When was it that we saw you, Lord? I hope that this year of Matthew has begun to change that question for you and for me. My prayer is that we would live lives so full of compassion and grace and mercy that our eyes would be so opened to the presence of God in our midst that when the judgment day comes, we may with boldness answer, Lord, when was it that we didn't see you? Amen. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are Form 6, found in the Book of Common Prayer, page 392, and in your order of worship. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For 
For Michael, our presiding bishop, George, our bishop, Brian, our bishop-elect, for Zach and John, our parish clergy, and for April, our newly called rector, for all bishops and other ministers. We offer to God the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Tom Nelson, Shirley Sullivan, Jim May, Jim Strickland, Gloria Barr, Francis Burnett, Connie Garman, Mary Cooper, Pat Camp, Lynn Fry, Nancy Taylor, Bill Strang, the Yarborough family, the Jacobs family, Carla Gothard, Jerry Evans, James Purple Jr., Kelvin Higginbotham, Nina Vassilis, Starlet Williams, Phyllis Cassavant, Rose Bernath, Michael Connor, Wallace Connor, Larry Lephart, Noel Chamberlain, Mary Ruth Clinton, Robert Armstrong, Marilyn Lowry, Kristen Evans, Larry McClure, Johnny Hankins, Thelma Varnell, Robert Clark, Garvin Colburn, Rosemary Frierson, John Fink, Amy Hall, Marty Landis, Linda Mathewson, Nancy Miller, Will Mullaney, Ann Swint, Candace Zachary, Dexter and Helen Williams, Cheryl McCurry, Patricia Williams, Ethel Rutledge, Edwin Brooks, Carolyn Minnick, Dot Arnold, Helen Swindle, and Dot Gannon. We pray for Christy Parker, Latricia Milburn, and Eric Mooney, who are with child. We pray for a Chip Moran, Mike Mabry, Jeff Wolford, Alexander Ross, Andrew Van Rinkle, Russell Webb, Logan Roberts, Jim Makepeace, Sean Benson, and all of our armed forces. For what else do we pray or give thanks? Hear us, Lord. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. And your compassion forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, God, may Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
Good morning. It's uh, great to see you all. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. And welcome, a special welcome to any uh, guests, family members, or first time visitors who may be among us. We're so glad you're here. Please know that in a few minutes when we come to the Lord's table to take communion, that all are welcome. You can find an instruction card about communion on the card in, your, in the pews there. And if you would like to receive more information about grace, uh, we would love it if you would fill out the card there, detach it, and drop it in the offering bag. And then come to see us and share a bite uh, to uh, hospitality, uh, some cookies and punch, uh, probably due to the coldness in the library this morning, immediately after the service. And uh, I'm going to hand it over now to Vivian Dodds with a message about next week. Next week we're celebrating St. Nicholas Sunday. If you've listened to NPR, you know everybody in the community has been invited. We are trying to strengthen our ties with Shiny Penny School, so we are inviting all those students and parents. We have no idea how many people are coming, but the Lord has always been bountiful. But we need help. George and Stephen are going to be staying after church to help set up tables and chairs, and they would like help. Pat and I will be in the kitchen. Uh, particularly around 4 o'clock, we would like people to come in and help. So I will have something in Grace Notes. I am having difficulty with my phone. It's like me getting old and very weak. So my email is still working, and I'll make sure that that address is in there. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. And again, uh, that's next week. The service of Advent Lessons and Carols, a great English tradition, begins at uh, 5 p.m. with some stellar music uh, by our choir. And then the St. Nicholas Dinner is an annual tradition at 6 p.m. in the Undercroft. We'll share a meal together, and then all the kids will be visited by jolly old St. Nicholas. And while they're not watching, uh, we'll have a kids program, and while they're not looking, Nicholas will go and drop candies in their shoes, and then they'll be surprised uh, and have a nice uh, uh, sugary evening. You know, on that note, uh, I hope that, like I said, everyone had a good uh, Thanksgiving holiday. I know that it can be a difficult time for many of you as well uh, who have experienced loss or um, uh, if you struggle with depression or other mental illnesses, there are lots of reasons why the holidays can be different, difficult. And so I want to encourage you uh, during the season uh, to please come to church. This is where you need to be. Uh, this is your family, and if, especially if you struggle, come here so that we can support one another, encourage each other, and lift each other up in prayer. And if you have family members or friends or neighbors who you know could use community at this time of the year, please invite them to grace. This, this is the time uh, to do it, and we have lots of great uh, gatherings and festivities uh, coming up to do so. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because you are greatly glorified in the assembly of your saints. All your creatures praise you, and your faithful servants bless you, confessing before the rulers of this world the great name of your only Son. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food of, and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father now and forever. Amen. <coughs> and now
Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. These are the gifts of God for the people of God, holy food for holy people.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and Now, my friends, remember that life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey the way with us. So be quick to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessing of Christ the King, ever creating, redeeming, and sanctifying us, bless you and keep you and go with you this day and into eternity. Amen.
Go forth in peace to love and serve the King of Kings. Alleluia, alleluia.